and uh, we're going to have some favorites tonight for those who have birthdays or anniversaries. And if you, uh, or if you want to give a testimony about couples retreat, retreat, something the Lord spoke to you about, or something that you learned, uh, you can give a testimony. Uh, then you can have, you can say your favorite. Okay, let's do it that way. All right. Uh, let's sing happy anniversary to Pastor and Mary. We're glad they're back with us. They're away uh, speaking in Hamilton this morning. Let's sing happy anniversary to them, and then we'll sing number 191 after that. You can stand up, sure. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Thank you. You can be seated. Only anniversary. Now, it's not today. It's the 19th, but the only anniversary in April. So, yeah, maybe we'll have some more anniversaries there. Anyone else getting married? I don't know. Okay. 191. In my heart, there rings a melody. 191. And then right after that, we're going to have Patch come and sing for us. I have a song that Jesus gave me, it was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody, tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sin away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Twill be my endless theme in glory, with the angels I will sing. Twill be a song with glorious harmony when the chords of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Game, game I just created. Okay, how do you play? I'll give some clues, and whoever can guess will get to share their clues next. It's about Bible people who struggled with pride. He was very tall. He defied the armies of the living God. But when a shepherd boy put his trust in the God of Israel, the giant fell flat on his face. Who was it? I know, it was Goliath. What a fall that must have been. You're right, so it's your turn. The Old Testament king of Babylon became so proud of his great power and kingdom that so God caused him to become a old wild man. He lived in the field and ate grass like an ox until finally he lifted his eyes up to God and God restored his reasoning. Who was this king? Was it King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel? Indeed, you guessed right. Okay, here are my clues. This disciple in a moment of pride told Jesus that he would never deny him. But when the cock crowed twice, this disciple had denied Jesus three times. When he realized it, he was very sorry and cried bitterly. Who was it? It was Peter. You guys are really good at this game. We sure learned a lot about pride and selfishness in our patch club this month. We saw that people like Peter who repented of their pride, God blessed them and used them. But people like Goliath who hated and mocked God, their pride brought a great big fall.
Keep up the good work. So good to see you in church tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to meet together. I ask for your hand of healing to be on the church family that's not uh, feeling well and, and still uh, experiencing sickness. May you raise them up quickly. And uh, we ask that you'd meet with us in a wonderful way tonight. As we sing the songs of the faith, may it come from our heart and uh, that the messages of encouragement would encourage our hearts and where we're challenged to live like you, Lord, that uh, we would move forward with those decisions and be with Brother Hannibal as he preaches. Empower him, I pray, and Lord, that this evening would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, who has a testimony or favorite? Somebody on this side? I get to pick all the favorites if nobody picks one, you know. And I do that every week. So, <laughs> anyone over here? Yeah, if you have a birthday, you don't have to have a testimony or an anniversary. In the sweet by and by, okay. I don't think we've ever had that before. Nobody's wanted to do their favorites. In the sweet by and by. Number 41. Number 41. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Verse 3, to our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessing. 
blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen anyone else Okay, number 246, number 246. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, number 246. We'll sing first and last. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps And giveth me songs in the night Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever I am All right, anyone else? Yes, Henny. 247? All right, number 247. Amen. Good I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to And what His grace can do for you. Saved by His power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. When Life now is sweet and my joy is complete For I'm safe, safe, safe Great singing. Yes, Brandon. Amen. Yeah, thanks for that testimony. That was, that was good. I enjoyed that session as well. What, what was your favorite song there? Uh, 301. 301. All right. Number 301. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. And bids me at my Father's throne Make all my wants and wishes
pleasures known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escape the share till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Amen. Do we have anyone else? Okay. Sometimes it's hard to sum everything up, isn't it, what you learn in, in those sessions. Sometimes it's hard to get off your chair and say it, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Okay. Just uh, something to be mindful of. I was reminded uh, just before the service that schools are closed tomorrow, which likely means that there won't be any gym night. So I'm going to verify that tomorrow. But keep that in mind. If So we will plan on not having gym night. If something changes with that, I'll send out a telegram to the church group and let you know. But that was not in the original contract. And then with the eclipse, they're so concerned. I wish they were that concerned about the ch what, the, what happened to the children's eyes every single day and what goes into them. And uh, not just on the day of the eclipse. But uh, anyway, I'll get preaching here if I don't watch it. <laughs> Wednesday, look forward to uh, Dr. Patricia Cottrell coming and then that cookie and coffee fellowship afterwards. Ladies, if you could bring some cookies for that. Work day, Saturday, uh, come on out, be part of the activities. And it, it, it can be fun too, okay? But that's not our primary purpose for getting together. We'll get some work done and enjoy fellowship with each other. And then also... Uh, Joy Ministry, April 18th at the Mutars. We'll get a sign-up sheet. There should be a sign-up sheet by Wednesday for that. And uh, get signed up there. Faithful Men Conference. Praise the Lord. We got three. We have three men. Of the seven that are preaching, three are coming from New Hope. So that's a blessing to see. And uh, pray for these guys as they preach. Bring God's word. And then Jake and Anna, that's coming right up. They're moving day. Excited for them. If you can be part of that, either in the morning for loading up or in the later on, or for both, I know they'd really appreciate it and uh, touch base with them. The youth conference, we'll get a sign-up sheet for that too by Wednesday. And uh, I know that will be a challenge, a blessing uh, to the young people. And also, if you um, haven't looked at the lost and found table, do that because those items... Except for the Bibles, we'll be gone. Ushers, if you can come, we'll take the offering tonight. Brother Jacob, pray, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for just your love and your many blessings. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for this church. I ask that you be with those that are not well tonight. I ask that you would just give them a special measure of your grace. And just help them, Lord, that they'd be better in the very near future. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one that was able to come. Speak to our hearts at this time. I ask you to be with Brother Hanny as he teaches and preaches. I ask that you would just empower him, fill him with your spirit. And, Lord, I ask at this time you'd also bless the gift and the giver. Lord, that it would honor and glorify you and that your work would go forth. And, Lord, that uh, uh, many people would be blessed through that. In Jesus' name, amen.
thankful for Brother Hanny and his uh, desire to minister, his ability in the word. Come on up, brother, and uh, deliver the message for us tonight. Thank you, Pastor Greg. Um, we're going to be looking at a passage from Philippians chapter 2. So in a moment, if you open there, that would be, uh, <clears throat> that would be fine. But before we do any of that, let us pray. Father, I come before you this evening with a heart that is full of thanks for your provisions, every sort of things that we need, you supply. I thank you, including health. And I pray, thanking you in advance, that you will bless us tonight as we share the word of God. I pray that you will touch hearts that you will enable us to learn, but you'll enable us also to see from your word how we could apply some of the lessons to our lives. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that uh, I had missed talking about, and I, the thought came to me the other day, is, um, is there a, a, a character in the Bible, a person in the Bible, that you would like to know more about? For example, I've been talking about people that I like to talk about. But perhaps there's someone that you think about. Their names could be perhaps an unfamiliar name. So that when we pronounce it, we say, what in the world is that? That sounds Greek. Well, it probably would be Greek. But uh, if there is an individual you'd like to learn more about, let Pastor Greg know, and then if we have a number of those names, we pick up one or two or whatever as the Lord allows us. But uh, it's interesting to, somebody asked me if I could talk about Onesimus. So, Lord willing, we will talk about him next week. But, Titicus? I don't know. Epaphras? I don't know. Trophimus? I don't know. Go to a passage, find a name. What in the world did this person do that his name was recorded in the Bible? Because remember, none of those names that we are talking about, not a name actually in the Bible is recorded that is not intended for us to learn from. Now, the Bible has lots of names about people who were evil. Think of Cain and Esau and Jezebel and Ahab and the list goes on. We learn how not to live like them. We learn how they disobeyed God, what they did that God said, I'm not happy with you, give them a chance, they refuse, and then, on the other hand, we are looking at people whose lives ooze out the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you read about them, you say, wow, I would love, I would like, I would very much desire to live a life that like these people. And the lessons, by the way, ladies, are not just for men. Maybe one category of those lessons is you cannot be a bishop or a pastor. But every other thing, you could be just as much as the men. And the lessons are for all of us. So when we look at these people, <clears throat> let's think of them as uh, signposts that God intended for us to learn from. And as we learn, and learning is good, and knowledge is good, but then we take it one step further. Knowledge put into practice good knowledge put into practice is wisdom, and God wants us to be wise in our lives. Thus far, we have looked at uh, four people that uh, his name, their names are well known in the New Testament. We looked at Andrew, one of the apostles. We looked at uh, Lazarus, the one that Jesus rose from the dead. We looked at uh, Barnabas, and we looked at Silas. Tonight, by God's grace, we will look at another tongue twister. His name is Epaphroditus. Now, in North America, we'd call him Epaphroditus. But Mary said, no, <laughs> Epaphroditus. That's the Greek way. You remember, I don't know if you're old enough to know when the capital of China used to be called Pekin. What is it called now? Beijing, because it's the right thing to do. You call it in their own language. So if I say Epaphroditus, you know that this is the Greek way of pronouncing this, the name of this uh, saint. <clears throat> we first hear about him 
in the letter of Paul to the church in Philippi, starting with verse um, chapter 2 and verse 25. So let us see uh, what the Bible tells us about him and what we can learn from the life of this saint. You can read from 25 to 30. You can watch it on the screen, but I'm going to read it. Yet I suppose it's necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that he had heard that he, that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men, such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service towards me. Then we go to chapter 4 and verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And the last reference we read about him is in verse 23 of the same chapter, where we read, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, Amen, to the Philippians, written from Rome by Epaphroditus. So, <coughs> excuse me. When we read uh, the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts and the epistles that Paul was inspired to write, you will notice that Paul and his team, because he always traveled with teams, he never traveled alone. Paul and his teams established churches in uh, Turkey, was not called Asia in those days. If you read it in the Bible, it was Asia, but it was Turkey, as well as Europe. And uh, he often would write to these churches, admonishing, correcting, telling them how much he loved them and caring for them, but they always were some sort of correction in those letters. There was one church, however, that was very special to his heart that um, he wrote to in a very, very special way, and that was the Church of Philippi. And uh, so why, why this special relationship? Why not the Ephesian Church or Colossae or the others? Well, we're going to look at that. And it's an interesting, think of it as a love story between Paul and the people in the Church of Philippi. <coughs> the, um, the Church in Philippi, you would remember, was started... If you remember what we talked about Silas a few weeks ago, Paul and Silas and Timothy and their team were preaching in Turkey, and they wanted to go either north in Turkey, and God said no, or south, further south in Asia, Turkey, and God said no. So they were praying, Lord, where do you want us to go? And then they had a dream and in the, or a vision, and in that vision, they saw a man of Macedonia telling them, come over and help us. So... Paul understood clearly that God wanted them to go across from Turkey into what is now known as Macedonia, and he started the way the, the church started in, in Philippi. So um, you might remember some of the things that we talked about from, from Silas, but um, this church loved Paul as well. They were a grateful church. And when Paul needed help, they were the only church that would send support to him, financial support. Actually, they liked him so much, they sent help three times. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 9, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church that he loved a lot, that he spent lots of time there, more than one and a half years, and it was a church full of problems. And he was telling them, And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. 
When he says Macedonia, he's talking about Philippi. <clears throat> so the church sent lots of funds. They prayed for him definitely. And in this situation here, we understand that they also sent him um, some funds. And they also sent him a special person, Epaphroditus, not only to carry the funds, but also to serve him, look after his, think of it as he's going to be the, in Spanish they would call it the mayordomo, the one who looks after him in the house. He's the, the person in the house looking after his needs, but also to do ministry work. He says, wow, this guy's something else. So we're going to look a little bit more about that. Now, in if you were to ask a question, who were the first people that got saved and were members of the church in Philippi? We know Lydia, famous businesswoman, seller of purple and whatever. But who else was there? You can imagine this jailer and his family. He was a ruffian. He wanted to please the people. When I told him, put him in, the, in jail, he put them in the stocks and he beat them up. If you remember Silas and, <coughs> excuse me, Paul. And then you have the ex-diviner, the woman that was demon-possessed, and then Paul exercised the demon out of her. He prayed and the demon was chased away, and she most likely having got saved, she joined the church. And then, I would imagine the prisoners who were there, and you can imagine what kind of ruffians, die-hard criminals, the kind of punishment. That I took this picture from a history book about how the, the, the ruthless criminals were punished in jail, the way they chain them, the way they treat them. No wonder these people never left when the earthquake happened and all the chains fell apart. None of them left because they had heard about liberty, true liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can imagine that <clears throat> there were people like Lydia because she wasn't alone at the river when they would meet every Saturday. And then uh, we would think also that because the earthquake that took place and the miracle that happened did not happen in, in secret, it happened publicly. Everybody knew about what happened in jail. So I can imagine the accusers of Paul might have repented. Those who sent them to prison might have had, wow, God is visiting us. And the soldiers who were present, both in the jail and elsewhere, perhaps they got saved also. All to say is that the early crop in the Philippian church was not your Sunday school children, nor Sunday school teachers. They were a bunch of ruffians. They never cared for God, but God's mercy was great, and they got saved. So here we look at it. This, was ha this happened in year around 50, 51 AD. Okay? The letter written to the church in Philippi by Paul was written about 12 years later, around the year 62, 63 AD, about three years before Paul was killed or executed. <clears throat> so what makes this change? How, how, what do we know now about the church in Philippi at the year 63 AD, 12 years later? Look at that. It was a church that um, it was established. They already had bishops, deacons, in the plural. If you have a small church, you don't need more than a pastor. You don't have more than a few deacons, but they have bishops, and deacons. And I was reading some in the historical records. It was about 150 to 200 people church, which this was a big church. And they no, long, no longer were meeting in the house of um, Lydia or even the house of the jailer, because most likely that's what they would have met. But the number now was very large. They were meeting somewhere else. But anyway, it was a good sized church. It was um, a church that was grateful. Like I said, they sent three times funds to Paul. It was a church that was loved by Paul. And it was a church, the only church that had no theological issues. In all the letters that you read about the letters he sends, Ephesus and Colossae and Thessalonians, you name them, they all had issues. Big, serious theological issues. They had none. Now, they did have a problem. 
and their problem was people problem. And they have two women, one whose name was Sweet Smell, Evodia, or Evodias, and the other one which meant good luck, Sintiki, and they were the ones who are fighting who was more important in the church. And they were about to cause a split. So one of the interesting, uh, if you wish, uh, Paul took the occasion to write this letter, not only to thank them and to commend them and to remind them of how to live, but also to say, hey, ladies, shape up. We can't have disunity in the church. And he sends a brother and he says, please look after these ones and make sure that they have one mind in the Lord. It's very important to, by the way, if you see any issue that causes disunity in the church, don't sleep on it. Don't murmur neither, nor grumble, nor guess what I saw today, or listen to what I heard yesterday. Don't do that. That's a secret that Satan would very much love to pump up, and just like you have fire, and just talk to the pastors, talk to the deacons, and pray about it. And it's important that a problem or an issue be put out, but don't just talk about it and murmur among friends. That's not good. That's not what God says, because that brings disunity within the church. So um, the church sent this gift with Epaphroditus. So, which begs a question. Who was Epaphroditus? And what do we know about? And that's where we're going to embark a little bit about <clears throat> who he was as an individual. He was born, most likely, to Cypriot parents from Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. And his name means handsome. The meaning of his name is handsome. Named after the goddess Aphrodite, which is the patron goddess of Cyprus. She is the goddess of love and beauty. So his parents wanted to bring him good luck. They gave him the name of Apophroditus. But um, you look at it, and there are no... Uh, you go to Cyprus today, you go to the city of Paphos, there's uh, ruins of a temple for her name. And this big island, this, this big stone, a huge stone, you see it if you're traveling between uh, two major cities in the south of Cyprus from Limassol to Paphos. You see it. We, we swam in not far from there. So anyway, it's a beautiful place. And if one of these days the church were to do a trip to Greece, Cyprus, whatever, hey, Mary will be your guide. You know, it'd be. Uh, anyway, he, um, he was given the name. He grew up enlisted in the Roman army, did very well, and according to historians, he was recruited into the Praetorian Guard. And if you know anything about the Praetorian Guard, they were the ones who would look after the emperor. They were like special trained police or soldiers that nobody would ever pass through them to get to the emperor. They were meant to protect him. And one of the things that, about the Praetorian Guards is when they reach about the year of 50, they would retire, and as a special gift in retirement, they would be allowed to settle in the city that was built for retirees of the Praetorian Guard. And that city was called Philippi. There were lots of coins. I was reading about there are lots of coins that would, from Philippi that would have the name Praetorian Guards, Emperor's Praetorian Guards. So anyway, historians think that uh, after retiring at the age of about 50, he was given a good chunk of fertile land and a good amount of money to settle and retire well as an ex-servant uh, of the emperor. That was the reward. And um, so here's, here's where he is in Philippi, a town that is not his own, and then that's where many Bible historians believe he got saved. And then after getting saved, he joined the church. Somewhere between... 51, 52 AD, and then maybe a few years later. His background and his uh, military training, his discipline, his knowledge, and his ability, having traveled wide, uh, made him a, a very good person to be a leader in the church, a good administrator in the church. So this is a little bit about his background. And uh, so... The church heard, most likely, this is me thinking. If you, re if you read in the book of Acts, the last three chapters, you, you know that Paul was sent from 
the, uh, the ruler, the governor of, um, uh, not Felix, but I forgot his name. He was sent to Rome because Paul appealed to Caesar. On the way, there was a huge storm. The boat was completely destroyed. And whatever Paul, Dr. Luke, the others who were traveling with them, whatever savings they had, guess what happened to them? They were all gone. They were lost. So they had no money. They had no luggage. They only had the clothes on them. And they arrived in Rome. And one of the things they had to do was to rent a house because he was to be under a house arrest. So how in the world would you rent a house if you don't have money? And Rome is like Toronto. Rents are expensive. So I read somewhere that it's very likely that uh, Luke wrote to some of the churches and said, hey guys, this is what happened. We need some funds. And so the church of Philippi sends Epaphroditus to take the funds and said, and while you are there, you're going to do some ministry work also. So, um, let's look at the road they traveled. If you, were to, if you were to read in history, Rome had developed the road so well in the system, allowing them, the army to move fast and allowing for trade and development. So, here the road, the Via Ignatia, would be all the way from Constantinople, which is Istanbul today, all the way going down through, um, uh, what do you call it, Philippi, and going all the way down to the sea. That's the road they would have, they would have left Philippi and then traveled to Dyrrhachium, and then from there by boat, and then into Italy. And by the way, these are to scale. And then you take all the way down to Rome. A 1,200-kilometer trip, and somebody said, given the knowledge of the day, whatever. It's about 60 days for a two-month trip, plus the boat, plus the, you know, trip by sea. Find a boat, get on the boat, go to the other side. So it's not a short trip. It's not like hopping from here to Tim Horton down the road and coming back. It's a long commitment. On top of that, it was well known that there were lots of areas that had, uh, <coughs> that had thugs that had thieves that, whose job was to rob people coming and going. So when Epaphroditus went, he did not go alone. That was the custom back then, because you travel, one, you have to be a good custodian of the money, because you want to give account to the church that this is the money that we gave. You read about it in Nehemiah and Ezra, how when they went, they, they were supposed to carry the amount, they gave it to people who gave account about it, so everything is above the water, clear. The other one is for protection. They needed to be protected from the, the events. Now, on the way, it is very likely you could get a bug, you could get diseases, you could get whatever it might be, but it's a long trip. And then Epaphrodus, when he did it, he did it with the idea that I have three tasks. I have to honor my church, I have to serve Paul, and I would like to witness. And some historians would say, one of the re reasons he was like jumping on the bit to go on this trip is because he could witness to his ex-Praetorian guards, to his ex-friends and soldiers, some of whom maybe are still there, but he was willing to witness to them. Can you imagine a soldier who knows the mindset of a soldier, who knows the heartbeat of a soldier, who knows the challenges of a soldier, to go out and say, in Christ, I can now go and I can do ministry over there. Just think about that. And um, so it's exciting to know that these were some of the reasons why um, Epaphroditus chose to go. Now, they go, <coughs> and um, they um, delivered the funds, and um, Epaphroditus is working and is um, serving. And, and again, one, one church historian believes that on the, tr on the third missionary trip, Paul stopped in Philippi. That was the third time he had gone to Philippi. And he asked Epaphroditus to go with him to Ephesus to witness and to be a missionary in Ephesus. And he stayed for two years. So uh, it is very possible that Paul had known him before and he knew Paul before. And just like a colonel would love to serve his general, they make the analogy that Paul now 
would want to work, uh, Epaphroditus now would like to work with Paul to further the, the gospel and the message. So, this is pretty much wraps around the individual, his qualities, and uh, his desire to serve, and uh, what made him an individual fit for this particular mission. Let's see how Paul and others describe him to give us some of the qualities more in-depth about this individual. Paul called him, verse 25, Philippians chapter, he called him my brother. And um, it's interesting that when you look at um, a verse like that, my brother, all the believers in Jesus Christ are brothers and sisters. And we all love each other. But as somebody said, I love all God's children, but some sure get on my nerves. <laughs> Epaphroditus and, and Paul did not get on each other's nerves. They meshed together very, very well. And I wonder, in a, in a church this size and this big, I wonder if there's some brother or sister who gets on your nerves. And if that's the case, I would humbly suggest, prayerfully suggest, that you go talk with that individual. What is it about me or about that makes us, I, I, I sense there is something in there. Is it me? Is it something in me that, that is causing this? And I would really like us to be united as the Lord wants us to be united. Is there something like that? Be humble enough about that and go and talk to somebody. And if somebody talks to you, be humble enough to accept it and see how we can be united. Because God wants us to be pulling. Just uh, think of it this way. Are you doing the pull the rope, um, what do you call it, challenge? What, what do you call it? Yeah, exactly. You want people to be pulling at the same time, in the same direction, so that it's unison. Can you imagine somebody says, I don't like him, I'm going to pull one way and the other. It doesn't work. Church is the same way. We need to be doing that. And we read that Epaphroditus was one person who was beloved, not only by Paul, but his church also. And it's a good example for us to say, okay, this is one, one good quality about this, this man. Another one is he was a, a companion in labor. Now, this is where I love the, the original languages because they describe the word to the T. The word companion in labor, now get a hold of this. It, it says he is a synergos. Where does the word synergy come from? comes from that word. And you know when people say there's synergy in here, what does it mean? We're all pulling together. We're all working together. And this is what this man was doing when he went to Paul's camp and was working. He said, now there's synergy. One plus one is no longer two. One plus one is like almost 21. We're working together, pulling on the same side in unison. And when you have someone like this, there is no discord. There's no dissidence. There's no disharmony. When he came to work, he was able to bring good qualities to the team. And Paul could call him, he was my synergy man. Amos 3.3 tells us, can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't. And these are people who were agreed and who were really um, working together for the Lord. I'm reminded the same word, by the way, was used in Corinthians 3, 9, when Paul talks that we are co-laborers with God. The same word. And when Titus is commended for his fellow work in, uh, in the ministry, he's a fellow helper. The same word was used. We're talking about synergy. And God wants us to have that kind of an attitude where I now can add value to the team. I'm not just somebody who's just hanging around, distracting people, causing, causing uh, this. Is, no way. I want to add value to the team. And this is what uh, Epaphroditus was. And then we see that he was a fellow soldier. He was no longer a soldier in the army, the Roman army, but now he's a soldier in the Lord's army. And what's interesting, again, the description of the word, the soldier, is not just a soldier. It's the one who receives commands. Uh, I have a very good Greek teacher at home. 
and I praise the Lord for that. Say, hey, Mary, well, get your Bible. What exactly does this word mean? So uh, the word, and I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. If not, I'll get a lecture back home. <laughs> Cistratiotis. Cis means together. Tratos means soldiers. Tratiotis means, uh, not soldiers, the army. Tratiotis means the soldier. But it means the one who receives orders. So here, Paul and his team, and now joined by Epaphrodites, are all soldiers receiving orders, and they are complying. They're working together in the same bunker on the same battlefield. Uh, what, what a beautiful picture to say he's not only my brother, he's not only my companion at work, but he's a fellow soldier in the same bunkers. We are listening to the same orders, and we're marching together in the same way. Beautiful picture in which Paul describes this dear fellow to him and to the people that he was working with. Then he said, he's an apostle. Mind you, this is not an apostle with a capital A. We're not talking about the disciples that the Lord Jesus called apostles. We're talking about apostle in the sense he was a messenger, a small a. Think of it, apostle with a small a. He was a messenger or an ambassador of the church. But again... The English lacks the true definition or description of this individual. It says, now you're going to become more Greek experts by the time you leave tonight. <clears throat> it says that um, the word liturgos, it comes, the word liturgy that you use in church today comes from that word. It means the one who gets things done. That's the exact meaning. And not only that, but he's the one who gets things done out of his own pocket. He was a man of means or an individual of means who was a civil servant. He was a servant of the church. He is a, a person who gets things done. That's the description that Paul says about Epaphroditus. And he gets things done properly in unity and in harmony with the group that is working over there. And by the way, just to edify you, the word unity is mentioned 903 times in the Bible. I don't know whether there are words of significance other than and and of and it and whatever that are mentioned more than 903 times in the Bible. An emphasis how much God cares that the body of Christ is united and is pulling the same way, and we are caring for and living for spreading the gospel. So he was, he was a person who could get things done, and he was a person who was uh, using his own funds to further the, the gospel and doing ministry over on the other side. So he was a minister, he was a lay minister, but he was also the, the guy who gets things done. I love that. Mary says, that's the meaning of the word. I love it. Sometimes the English doesn't give us all the gist that is there. Another thing, he almost died doing the work of Christ. He was nigh unto death. And that brings me to a very interesting point. We don't know how long he worked until he got sick. He might have worked three months, four months. We, we really don't know how long he got sick. But he got sick. And he got so sick that he almost died. Now, you know the trip takes two months. The trip is two months over and two months back. So we know it was more than four months. Because the church in Philippi heard about his illness. And they were worried about him and they were praying for him. And Paul was concerned that... Uh, Epaphrodites, who loved the church, is now more worried and is going to get more sick because his sickness made the church worried about him. So it's like a, a vicious cycle type thing. So wh where I'm driving at is that we know that in Paul's ministry, there were times when he raised people from the dead. He healed people. He was able to, by God's grace, do miracles. Actually, there were times when people will put... Uh, handkerchiefs, so that when Paul's shadow goes over them, they will put them on people and they get healed. How in the world he could not heal Epaphrodites, who was very dear, dear, dear to him? 
Now you fast forward. How could he not heal Timothy, who was also his child in the Lord? How could he leave, um, what's his name? Uh, is it? I have to get his name. Uh, but anyway, he left him sick in Miletus. Trophimus, yeah? How come? Remember one thing. If you read in the Bible, it tells you that the Jews always sought a sign and the Greeks always looked for wisdom. For wisdom. And the signs, and interesting this morning, Brother Brandon talked about the last thing mentioned in the book of, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, is that when they go out to preach and to do the Great Commission, signs will follow them. Why? Because they needed to authenticate the message that Jesus was Christ. That had to be authenticated. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he lived and he preached and he did many miracles to authenticate with signs the things he was preaching. A prophet had to prove that he was legitimate. Until that continued healing and speaking in tongues, again, to talk about the great things that God had done. That's why tongues were given, not to go and blah, 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 blabber, but they were to talk about what God thinks, uh, great things God had given, until such a time when there was no more need to prove to the Jews that Jesus was Lord. By, the, by 60 or 65 AD, the church by and large became Gentile church, like populated mainly by Gentiles, and there were Hebrews, there were Jews there, but the majority of the churches by then did not need a proof that you need to prove to me that this is what you're talking about. Okay, here's a miracle. Or I'm going to talk in time. I'm going to explain what Wayne said a while ago in another language. No, no more need for that. And this is one of the reasons why he said he waited until God healed Epaphroditus. He prayed for that. And God, I'm not saying that God is not a God that heals. I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to pray for healing. On the contrary, he wants us to do both. But he heals in his own way, in his own time, and we give him the glory for that. There's so much that you may watch on TV. And I was in Argentina, as an example, walking around not far from the hotel where I was staying. There's a big uh, movie theater that was converted into a church. And guess what church meeting they have Thursday night at 7? A healing service. Come at Thursday night, and we're going to heal you, buddy. Hello. If you hear that, stay away from that place, because that's not Christ doing the work. It's somebody else, and we know who, who's doing the work. When I start bragging about my healing powers, stay away from those guys. So, uh, where are we? So, I don't want to go chasing rabbits. So, he was nigh unto death, and then... He loved the church, and the church loved him. And I know this group of people, he loves the church, and the church loves you, but are there ways in which you sense you could love the church more? Are there ways in which you can offer work, offer services, you do what you... I don't know, but that's an example for us that, that we can get from, from him, from Ephroditus. Then... Paul says, when he comes back to you, when he, now, the one who carried the letter was Epaphroditus. There will be some people in the church who will say, hey, brother Epaphroditus, you're supposed to stay there for three years, and lo and behold, you're here, and you only have been there a few months. You have deserted the job. How many times you hear of missionaries who were forced to leave the place, and people will kind of look at them and say, you know, they're no good, they just... We're playing games. He says no. And one of the lessons we would talk about later on is to honor God's servants, is to honor the missionaries that come back home because of whatever reason. They, they could not stay there. So it's important that the, the church over there in, in Philippi, they honored him. And how was he honored? You will notice three things that are in the text. One, in Philippians chapter 4, and verse 2, he talks about, uh, I beseech Evodius, the sweet-smelling lady, and beseech Sintiki, she is the 
lucky girl, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also through yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Many uh, church historians believe that this yoke fellow, who is unmentioned, is none other than Epaphroditus, who was a minister in the church, who was a good counselor in the church. He had good discipline, and therefore he would be the one who would counsel uh, these two ladies. And from what we know is that the Philippian church stayed true and firm until the time when the uh, the, the, the Tatars, or when Europe was invaded by the Muslims, and then Philippi was burnt, that was when the church no longer uh, continued, about 1100 years A.D. So it was one of the churches that was strong, stayed strong, until, physically speaking, it was no longer there. So we know that whatever counsel that he did was good. Another thing that he was honored is that he was the first bishop of Philippi. Not only that, but he was also the bishop of Adriaca, which, according to geography, they were not far from each other, so he was the bishop of, well, think of it as the pastor of two churches. So he was honored for his services, he was honored for the love, he was honored for his good theology that he became the bishop of the church. And then, this is very interesting, is that God honored him and used him to pen the letter to the church in Philippi. God inspired Paul. Paul spoke and he wrote. So he's a, <clears throat> excuse me, he's a picture of a child of God who was a brother, who was a worker, who was a soldier, who was... Um, um, He was the guy who gets things done. You know, he was a minister who got things done. He was a theologian, and uh, he was a bishop, and then he was a, a script, a gospel writer. What a story. We don't know when he died. There's no record in the church history about if he, was, if he died natural death or if he was martyred or whatever. We don't know. Um, some historians, but there's doubt about this, say that he was one of the 70 that Jesus sent out in, in twos, but the history doesn't mesh. That's, it, it, so it's, it's suspect information. And um, the short form of Epaphroditus is Epaphras. So if you read Colossians and you read Epaphras there, and he was a leader in the church, don't confuse the two. They're two different people. They're two different uh, entities. I mean, the scripture is so clear that they are two different individuals. So, uh, just to help us understand. So, principles for us that we can learn from, from this good man. One is live a life that is worthy of the gospel. If you can squeeze him and ooze things out of him, it will be gospel. And he was living what Paul wrote to the Philippian church. He said, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What are we doing in our daily lives to make sure that the message of the gospel is spread out. I know in the case of Epaphroditus, he desired to go back and minister to his old comrades, the, the soldiers. But sometimes we don't have to do that. We are already in a place where people are there. How can we share with them? How can we take opportunities that without forcing them down their throats, or here comes the Bible thumper again, find ways, listen intelligently, and think clearly about what is going on, and then intervene with a message from the gospel that 
attracts people to Christ because Christ is the ultimate problem solver, if you wish. We need to be people living in such a way that we attract Christ because of the gospel. And what is the gospel all about? It is who Jesus is, who Jesus, what Jesus did, and what Jesus will do, past, present, and future. And if we cannot speak that in ways that relate on a daily basis to the events of people, then I would say, make it your business to learn how to do that. On occasions, you're sitting down somewhere, and then, oh, I don't know what to do. And what God could turn your spiritual radar on, and God will give you the wisdom to speak to the occasion. And you'll be able to minister to the people the right way. You don't have to preach thunder, and, you know. On, no, but you can tell them that God is the one who can help you out of this particular situation. Well, how can he do that? Then God opens up more doors, and you do that. But let your life be focused around how, God, you've put me in this place. And until you take me out, help me see my people appreciating the gospel. It's a huge lesson. That's what this man did. He was a rugged soldier, but then God transformed him. And by the way, you say, how could the church in Philippi be transformed within 10 years to be such a church that had money that could send funds and they could send missionaries? Well, the pastor talked about it this morning. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. When God starts working in, in, in an individual's heart, he's going to change him completely. He's not going to whitewash the walls. He's going to make a transformation, total transformation of the heart, of the will, of the desires. And I heard an old preacher say, I now have a new wanter on the inside. I no longer want to do that. I now I want to do this. God changes that. And the ruffians that we saw making the original group of believers in the church in Philippi became completely different. They had the mind of Christ, and they were working for that. Proof, Epaphroditus. Another lesson for us is uh, live in unity within the church. And again, what do we mean by that? If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy and be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. God wants us to work together. And I'm not saying we're all, uh, you know, sometimes you're putting squares and circles and cogs and gears or whatever. People are different, and we need to be different, and we need to live the lives God has designed us to or created us to. However, it needs to be done in harmony, just like an engine. It has all sorts of gears and moving parts, whatever, yet it does one thing. It creates power. Our body is made of different members, but yet it creates the ability to think and live and be who we are church needs to be the same. So we need to live with an intention of unity. And like we said, the word unity is mentioned 903 times in the Bible. A good indication that God wants that. The other thing we, other lesson is to um, be a selfless person. We see in this man, Epaphroditus, he lived his life serving others. He could have sat on his porch he said, hey, guys, don't bother me. I've done my duty. I've done my work. Now it's time for me to have my beer or wine. I'm going to enjoy looking at my fields and don't bother me. No way. He said, hey, is there a trip that I can make? I hear that um, Brother Paul is in need in Rome. And can we do something about that? And I love the adage, if you volunteer for something, you're going to do it. So, okay, I'll go do it. And here you see Epaphroditus leaving the charge to help Paul. He was a selfless person. When he got sick and he could have left the work and gone back, he said, no, he was nigh unto death. He was working and overworking. And I'm not saying that we overwork to death. I'm just saying we need to be focused on being a selfless person. Quite often, and I, 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 uh, the first time I heard about me, myself, and I, I heard this is the unholy trinity. I said, oh, I didn't know there was an unholy trinity. The pastor said, when you think about nothing but about yourself, that's exactly what you're doing. 
and the pastor alluded to it this morning, we need to be thinking about others, not only me. I'm not saying that we don't look after ourselves. No, I'm saying that we have to give preference to others. Listen to what he says in Romans 15, verses 2 and 3. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And then he gives us the example, and he says in verse 3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it was written, he reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Christ gives us the best example of selflessness. He says, be like me. One of the biggest examples of selflessness, and that, and I thank God for that, it blows my mind, I cannot fathom it, is... um, Christ on the cross, and and we are admonished, Hebrews 12, verse 2. You're surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses. And then he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. If I, if I were to ask the Lord Jesus a question, what do you mean by the joy that was before you? You were enduring the cross. I mean, you were in pain and suffering. He would say, child, the joy of seeing... <coughs> get emotional. The joy of seeing you saved. That's why he stayed on the cross. The joy of seeing each and every one of you saved. That's why he stayed on the cross. He was selfless. The joy of seeing every Christian in the whole world saved. That's why he stayed there. He wants us to be selfless. How are we selfless today? Are we, are we inconvenienced by, I have to come to church this evening, you know. I, I, or how, it is, it is inconvenience for us. But it was suffering, it was sacrifice for the people like Epaphroditus, for Paul, for the Lord and for others. What in the world are we doing? Church, we need to wake up. When was the last time you've knocked at your neighbor's door and you talked to them about, about inviting them to church, telling them about the Lord, or somewhere you are and you share the gospel? I don't know, but you know. He wants us to not, not necessarily be inconvenienced. He wants us to live a selfless life. Not that we neglect our family, neglect our children. He's not saying that. He says there are ways in which you can still get beyond where you are today, and do it for the sake of Christ. And then, he says, take risks for Christ. Epaphroditus was a man who took risks. He would have said, you know what, guys? (laughs) There are bandits on the road. I'm not going. When you give me this much money, it's like I'm honey and all those flies are coming over. I don't want that. He could have said that. Or he could have said, hey, Paul, You know what? I don't like being here because you're in jail and I'm serving you and they're going to look at me and the government's going to come and check me out. Hey, listen, brother, I love you, but I'd rather not. No. And the bunkers together with Paul. How can we think about that? How would I take risks for Christ? Listen to this, and I, I love that. Proverbs 22, verse 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Therefore, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to do nothing because there might be a danger out there. If you're in Christ, he never leaves you nor forsakes you, number one. He promised that. If you're in Christ, he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. All your needs. I'm not talking money. I'm talking all your needs. If you're in Christ... There's nothing and no one that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's get on with the program. He says, take risks. And he's not saying, go jump off the the top of the building. He's saying, stand up and say, Lord, if there's need out there, I'm going to do it. By your grace, you're going to help me. And I know you will help me. And he said, child, I'm with you all the way. I'll guide you. We need to take risks for Christ. Listen to what Jesus said. In John chapter 12, 24 and 25, Verily I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, that is, if you're willing to take a risk, 
it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. That is risk. That is stepping out and saying, Lord God, help me to be the kernel of, of corn or wheat that you want me to be, that others will get to know more, and I can bring the sheaves home. It says, he who goes out weeping, taking his seed, the precious seed with him, will come back doubtless with the sheaves with his sheaves. With we need to be thinking, now, I need to be out and working, not sitting down being a potato couch. And they say, you know what, if I go outside, uh, they don't allow me to talk on the streets. They don't allow me to pray close to those abortion clinics. They don't want me to do that. Therefore, I'm going to abide. I'm going to stay home. I don't want trouble. No, he tells us to stand up and be counted. This is what this good man did. And then, Wear out. Don't rust out. I, I remember in a previous church, I would, <clears throat> I would encourage the older men, and Mary would encourage the older women, to be involved in the lives of the youth. Oh, Brother Annie, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that because I've already done lots of things in the church, and now it's my time to just sit back and enjoy it. There's no retirement in Christ, people. The day you retire is the day God calls you home. And until he calls you home, for every day he's going to give you a bucket of grace. And he says, go live it out. He, said, he will supply the grace you need. You go to the, throne of grace, uh, to the throne of God and he says, there's enough grace over you to find. There is enough mercy for you to use. Get moving. There's no retirement with God. And until the day God takes you home, there's a job for you to do. To encourage somebody, to share the gospel with somebody, to be kind to somebody, to prepare a meal to somebody, to go and talk, whatever it is, to somebody. I don't know what it is. But God has a special plan for you. And he said, do it. And then be grateful. We were encouraged in the, in the, um, in the Philippians that the church needs to highly honor and, and receive with joy God's servants. I'm, none of us is perfect, but how do I appreciate somebody? I'm not saying you give them gifts. I'm just saying, how do you appreciate them? How do you tell them, thank you for the message you gave? How do you tell them, I really appreciate your life, your ministry, your, your struggle? I, I don't know how. But well, one of the ways that Epaphroditus was appreciated is that they recognized that this man was a selfless man. He had a heart full of love. He had a heart that is full of gospel. And they honored him. And he became his bishop, their bishop. He became their pastor. I don't know how, but it is very important for us to welcome even missionaries that sometimes, unfortunately, have to leave the field earlier. I remember one time we were in Michigan. And Pastor Green, on a Wednesday night, was admonishing the church because a mission family that left the church, supported by the church, had to leave the Philippines and come back. The life situation wasn't suitable for them. They could not live there. And some of the people started already yakking. They left the field. They were deserters. You know, sometimes Christians can be very, very hurtful in words they use. And Pastor Green was like laying down the word. He says, don't you do that. And he was at this point. How do we appreciate the missionaries who go out all alone? And I see missionaries every time I travel. I see missionaries alone. There's nobody out there to help them. They don't have a church life like we do in here. They have to create a church life. They're so alone. They're so lonely. Let's be a blessing to them. Drop a letter, drop a note, a thank you to some of those missionaries out there. We think of you, we're praying for you. Do that. And then let's be grateful for what we have. What we have here is the envy of many, many other churches. And I praise God for that. Let's not take it for granted. Let us be the Epaphroditus. And I don't know if there's a female name for Epaphroditus, but the the lady folk need also to be a similar uh, mindset. 
I don't know where you are. But these are six lessons that we say, you know what, this is a tough thing to do. Well, Epaphroditus was given a name to honor a god, a, a pagan god, pagan god, an idol. But he lived a life where he honored the only true God, the King of Kings, his Savior. Can we do that? And God will honor you. Listen to this. I know we're like a few minutes over, but that's okay. We're having fun. Aren't you having a good time? Amen. Amen. Listen to this. Th this. This is like the icing on the best cake possible. Look what God says. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto, eternal, unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. I would far rather receive the honor of God than the honor of people. But it doesn't mean that we don't honor the servants that God put in our lives, the missionaries that God put in. But ultimately, the nicest command, the nicest um, call is when Jesus says, come faithful servant, and here my Father will honor you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the admonition you give to us, for the lessons you give to us. I don't know where people are. I do pray, however, that we will learn from the life of this servant of yours, this saint, and we would desire to live a life that, that thrives in the gospel, life of unity, a selfless life, a life that loves to serve you until the day you call us home, and ultimately a life that desires to be honored by you. I pray you bless, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we have a song of invitation. You know, as those different points were coming up, I hope you kind of had a mental checklist. And like, am I doing those things? Are those characteristic of my life? If God's putting your fing his finger on your heart in any area, deal with that. Say, God, I want to be. I want to be like that. I want to be faithful, doing what you've called me to do. The altar's open. As God's worked in your heart, just seal that with him. And let's be the people he's called us to be. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Well, Abby approached me about church, mem church membership uh, there a while back and I talked to her pastor, Pastor Wall at Faithway Baptist in Ajax, and he's, uh, he's gave the green light there, recommended her for membership. And so, Abby, would you come on up, give your testimony at this time? You may be seated, folks. Hello, I am Abby Illyrio, and I'm going to be reading my testimony. So, I grew up in what some may call a lukewarm Christian home. The basic Bible truths and stories were taught but, um, and emphasized, but church attendance was never really pushed in my home. And with that being said, um, my mom tried to bring us to church on Sunday mornings, but if we didn't make it, we didn't make it. One day, um, my mom decided we should go to Sunday school, and on that day, my Sunday school taught um, the reality of being saved and the consequences if you weren't. And that day of December 4th, 2011, I got saved. And a few weeks later, I followed in believer's baptism. I had a blast learning about the Bible and being saved. I had so much fun, I began to tell my grade two friends that they needed to be saved also. Um, and a few years after my salvation, my church unfortunately closed its doors, and my, church, my family then stopped attending church. And because of that, I began to drift from God. 
And at one point, I tried to separate myself from him, and I would question his judgment and ask why he would do such a thing to my family. And not many people know, but when I was young, my mom had passed away. And, um, well, yeah, well, she passed away. And um, the person I now call mom is actually my grandmother, but she raised me and my siblings, and, well, I only see her as my mom. And because of the unfortunate situation of my mom's passing, I'd ask God why he'd do such a thing and why he'd let my family suffer through so much pain. And the pain built up in me so much that it started to reflect through my personal life and my relationship with my family. And with that being said, I had to tell my mom, which is my grandma, and I told her that I didn't understand why such a loving God would take my mom away and um, take my mom away and her daughter away. Without hesitation, my mom told me that I'd gotten so far from God that I began to question him, and I knew that she was right, and I knew we had to go back to church. So that Sunday, we went to our first service at Faithway. Within stepping through the front doors, I felt the love of God throughout the church. We became faithful members in our attendance, then became members. From being in public school, I then enrolled to Faithway for high school, and then I did a year of biblical studies for college, and since then, I've moved down for work in college. However, since moving um, down to Tilsonburg, I've kind of struggled knowing that... Um, well, I kind of struggled because I knew, well, what am I saying? Sorry. I kind of struggled because I was always taught that I should serve in a local church and just be a part of the many different ministries. And because I'm not, well, it kind of reflected on my walk with God. So I do, um, and well, I'd like to be a member. Um, and I do plan on staying for a significant period of time. And I've already seen a lot of growth in my spiritual life with being at New Hope. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, for sharing that. Um, so I would recommend Abby for membership at New Hope Baptist. All in favor, say amen. amen. Any opposed? Amen. Welcome to the church family, Abby. And once we're dismissed, maybe just stand in the foyer there and folks can welcome you in and, and uh, trust that you'll serve and grow here. Let's stand as we sing our closing chorus. Not I, but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ, in every look and action. Not I, but Christ, in every thought and word. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee, oh, that it may be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives in me.